Tapi Do you do the uh, it's gonna be faster. The uh, so you're getting a breath squirrel with us here? <laughs> so, no, we're gonna stay. I'm gonna go s straight through the makeup from here. Oh, are you really? Eh? Yeah, take a couple days off for you. Uh, no, just pr present today. Let the stress, yeah, wane. Have a nice night. So, is this your uh, is this the yeah, this is this is just the intro screen. Yeah. But, uh, on Twitter and the whole. So yeah, this is the the hashtag for the conference. So okay. everybody who's tweeted about it, they show up on this tweet wall. Okay. So yeah, what's the horse talk on? Uh, PPID. Nice. Sean is Yeah, I don't know where that one is. Are right, you can catch up yet? Yeah, for sure. We'll see ya. Good afternoon. Hey, how's it going? Not too bad. Did you need some assistance? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. So the first part of my talk, I'm just going to have the projector off. 
so about for the first hour or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I'm going to play some audio, and I just want the audio to be able to come through sure. on the speaker system. Um, Audio set up. I'll just grab a, a box and I can set this up. Sure. Be back in just one moment. No problem. Two lines in there. A cat going to be a camera on you from this angle. Okay. And then you can see there. So. Perfect. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> poach an extra podium just for more stuff. All your stuff. I really like the tweet wall. I haven't seen one of those before. Yeah, Kelly had one going at the convention too. Oh, did right you? At the okay. trade show. Well, yeah. well, but it didn't have all the pictures in it. It just had this part. So yeah, there's there's definitely a, dump, a bunch of different companies. Um, this one is it's just Tweet Bean. I tried to get a Tweet Wall. It's a little better. It actually has a ranking at the bottom, so oh, people yeah. who are tweeting the most during this specific event. And you can also add additional hashtags onto that. Uh, I tried to get that going, but this one was easier. Yeah. Long. That's great. So yeah, get a feel for it for sure. Yeah. So have you been here all weekend or just uh, we came in yesterday afternoon. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first time we've been away from baby fifty months. So we kind of came down and then babysitting. And, uh, well, that's really yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> so we got a, a chance to get away, so we just went to the town. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's, that's a big step that first time away. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> that's exciting. Both individually been away, but, uh, yeah. but never both together. <laughs>
well, that's the thing. I know uh, uh, Kelly is following you. You know, he's got two young kids too, and that's it. We were, they were, they were um, skyping or you know, yeah. <laughs> and that, and you think, oh, that's that's good because uh, it, it gives you that you know, calming feeling, right. like things are under control. Right. I can relax. <laughs> that's so easy. Now, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah, Kelly's babies were sick. Yeah, yeah, has fever. Yeah. That always happens, right? Just right yeah. when you're trying to decide if you should yeah. leave or not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's good. So you were in on the keynote? Yes, and that's why I, 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 I sipped away right when we were finishing, so it takes a while for me to get over here, so we might not be able to start late on, okay. late on time. But my, but, yeah. my first hour. It's pretty concrete, but after that, I definitely have to like to go even if it goes straight into questions. That's okay. fine. Yeah. And if we are ready, I think I don't know Kelly has a little bit of flexibility to do. So we're I'm supposed good. to we're supposed to end at three, I guess, for this part. Yeah, I'll be cognizant yeah. of that for sure. Yeah. He thinks that I can yeah, if I go over that, he wants to be able to shorten the back. I don't want to be able to see it. It's good. It's good. It's
I just need the audio file to play, so I can set a volume. Oh, sure. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. Teenagers, I think email's too slow for them at that point of your life. That's yeah. good. Perfect. Thank you so much. No uh, problem. And then for Mike. Okay, and that'll overplay on that. We don't have to switch back and forth or anything like that. Perfect. Welcome to the Food Animal Program. It's uh, something we've uh, been here all day, but uh, uh, my name is Jocelyn Forsey. I'm the moderator this afternoon, taking over from Dr. Benson this morning. Uh, just uh, 
a word to the wise. Um, there's live streaming going on, as I guess uh, Cody told me about that, but I'm not sure where it's streaming to, so he'll fill us in on that. <laughs> uh, so this session is Social Media in Practice, and I'm happy to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Kobe Grillman. For anybody on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, he's certainly out there, so I'm really looking forward to his presentation. Uh, Kobe received his Bachelor of Science in Agriculture in 2006, from U of A and his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine in 2011 from uh, WCBM. He grew up in Beaver Lodge, Alberta on a commercial cow calf operation uh, where they also raised purebred Semitol cattle. Dr. Creelman joined Veterinary Ag Health Services in May 2011 as an associate veterinarian and is now a managing partner. His professional interests include pathology, large animal surgery, cow calf and feedlot production medicine. Since becoming a veterinarian, Dr. Creelman has discovered a new passion revolving around the use of mobile technology in the field. This includes consulting on veterinary application design projects, as well as leveraging various social media platforms to market veterinary services. So let's welcome Dr. Creelman. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? I'm going to take a quick selfie. I'm a little sad that the room is How's that? No. How's that? Better? Perfect. Say hello to everybody out in YouTube land that I'm live streaming to. So I've been getting lots of tweets coming in that they can hear voices in the background and uh, they're trying to speculate who's out there. So I'll get started. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cody Creelman and I am a veterinarian at Vet Agri Health Services. So a little more background about our practice. We are a four person vet practice and we deal primarily with beef cattle. We're about 50% uh, cow calf and 50% feedlot. So, as was mentioned, I joined the practice in 2000. Is this distracting to you guys? I see lots of eyes going there. I'm going to shut that down so you guys can see that. All right. So, I joined the practice in 2011, and one of the first tasks that they had for me was to bring the practice into the 21st century out of the dark ages and get ourselves a website. So that was a pretty big deal. So we enlisted the help of a Dutch app designer and web developer named, his name was Mr. Diedrich Schurdan, with the help of Vetoquinol, and we created this relationship. So Diedrich, the city boy from The Hague, Amsterdam, came on the road with me. I took him out hacking deads, I took him out preg checking, and exposed him to the life of a cow vet. Now he thought this was an amazing story. He couldn't have fathomed that this was somebody's job and he was just blown away. And he thought we needed to share that story with the world. So the first step was to build the website and really focus on telling people who we are and what we did. So a website is very important for various reasons. Number one, it acted as a place where our current clientele could come and visit. We could provide information to them. We could tell them about things that we were doing, our news and views, what we were doing with students in the university. So that was an important part. It was also important for building relationships with academia. We could our story, who we were, and what we did. And that, to me, was one of the most important parts. So on top of that, creating that website, which took a lot of time and effort to make it something that we were proud of, we went from there to maybe making that a little more visible. So to have a static, even if it is a dynamic website, you need to draw people to that to make it effective. So number one, we used SEO or search engine optimization 
to bring the ranking of our website up on a Google or Bing search. We use things like improving backlinks and making appropriate content for that website so it would search and rank higher. Also with Google or with Bing, we also did things like paid advertising. So I learned all about Google AdWords. So you're basically clicking out bids for various content in markets that you're, markets that you're focusing on. And that was another important thing. The one thing that Diedrich did kind of push on me was what ended up being the most important part to this whole marketing strategy of our website and trying to share our story. And that was social media. And I'll be the first to admit, I didn't get it at first. I grew up in a house without internet. I didn't have a smartphone until I was in practice. And I guess I had a Blackberry for a year and that doesn't even count. So I didn't even really have a smartphone right off the bat. I had a Facebook page. I maybe had logged into LinkedIn a couple of times. And remember this is 2011. I just didn't quite get it. But as time went by and with some pushing from Diedrich, telling me that I need to learn how to use this technology to my advantage, it finally started growing and growing and it started clicking. And I started to understand that the route I have to do it. And this whole marketing and advertising, the veterinary practice, or my veterinary practice is what was really the fire in my belly that made me learn and get better and to, to do everything that I could to market effectively. So then I started looking around the, or looking around the profession of veterinary medicine and I was absolutely dumbfounded at the lack of marketing that even existed, let alone social media marketing. And the last thing that I ever want to do today is try to convince any veterinarian out there that they need to market their practice. I can't convince you, I can't make you take that step to jump in and start marketing. And as crass as it may sound, that's kind of a good thing for me, or it's a good thing for those of you that do choose to market your services and your product and your brand. It's good because while you are deciding whether or not you should market, let alone whether or not you should market on a digital stage and whether or not you're taking the time to figure out how to do that effectively. I've been able to maybe create relationships with prospective clients, maybe clients of other veterinarians, and I'm building that relationship. And I've been doing that over and over and over again at scale. I've been building that. And some of you might say, I don't need any of that. I do word of mouth marketing and that's all that matters. And that's great, I get that. But the funny thing is, is social media marketing is word of mouth marketing. And I think that's a strategy you guys can understand. This means that the old, the old timey small town rules apply. That if you provide a great service or poor service, that is going to spread like wildfire. And that's what social media has done. It has made this communication of whether or not you're providing great service, great value, and it's letting that information spread throughout, whether it be the Twitterverse or just the overall digital network. You guys understand that um, word of mouth marketing is there. And social media is word of mouth marketing on steroids. And storytelling is at its core. Now marketing has always been about great storytelling. And from the dawn of man, if someone had something to sell, if they could tell a great story about that, they were probably gonna make that sale. Now the product or service had to be good. If you were trying to sell a subpar or a poor product or service, no amount of storytelling or marketing was ever going to overcome that. But if you're selling a great product and you're telling a great story, you're gonna win in terms of marketing. Listen, I don't care if you're selling nuts, bolts, or peanut butter, because it all boils down to the same business, and that's the eyeballs and ears business. The business of getting attention so you can tell your story, and from there, you can go on and create that relationship. But the world is a noisy place. 
it's hard to get that story out there. It's hard to get the eyeballs and ears of people on you so you can tell who you are and what you do. From the year 2002, every 48 hours, we create the same amount of data, the same amount of content in a 48 hour span as was ever created from 2002 to the beginning of history. So every 48 hours, we create that same amount of data, that same amount of content as was ever created before. That's how noisy this, this world is getting. That's how hard it is to get attention. And that is actually doubling every year. It's increasing at an exponential rate. It is very noisy with all of this content out there. And you may have heard the term content is king. And that's true. So producing great quality content, whether that be a photo, a video, a vine, a snap, a tweet, a vlog, a blog, you have to make sure that that is great content. And it's very, very important. But what you may not have heard is the term context is God. So if content is king, context is God. And what that means is putting that content that you create for your veterinary practice in a place that actually makes sense. That means that an Instagram post actually has to make, has to look like an Instagram post. That means that it's a picture that's visually compelling, that's beautiful, that has great crops, it has a great filter, that it has descriptive text describing what that picture is, whether it be short or telling a long story. And it has the appropriate hashtags to narrow in and target the demographic that you're searching for. Or if we're talking about a Vine, so a Vine is this six second looping video phenomenon, this social platform. If you're going to Vine, you have to have content that actually fix, fits the context. So comedy is at, at its core, and maybe I'll show you a little more of that. You have to have good cuts, good edits. And if you're doing Twitter right, and this applies for any platform for that matter, if you're doing Twitter right, you need to figure out what that context is for you. And there's a certain amount of common sense to this. So if you're a small animal practitioner, you're gonna be talking about puppies and kitties and probably not talking about sugar cookies and cake. That makes sense. So what I do to support my clinic's brand is I talk about cows, cows, and more cows. I don't sit back and watch, and watch Twitter and say, hey, I got a sick cow. I see somebody that says, hey, I got a sick cow. I don't jump in there and say, hey, I'm Cody the cow vet. Book an appointment with me. I'm a really good vet. Trust me. That's not what I'm doing. I'm going in there and I'm creating relationship and I'm providing value and I'm creating a context because in Twitter, it's like a cocktail party. It's a 140 character cocktail party. So I'm just jumping in there and I'm talking to them and I'm providing value. And for me, providing value in that context is my industry news and views. I'm acting as a media company, a cattle media company. I'm providing news and views and tips and tricks for that specific industry. And what that value does is it acts as a jab. So this comes from a, this is, comes from the wine guy. So this is a, a guy who uh, wrote some books. He has a large media company for Fortune 500. And he wrote this book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And what the jab, 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 right hook means is that a social media platform and social media marketing is like a boxing match. And what the jab is, is it's providing value, it's giving. So you give, 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 you try to give to these people. And the right hook is the ask. So you provide, you overwhelm with so much value to a prospective client or customer, you give them so much value that when you do make that sales pitch, they almost feel obligated to respond to that and to purchase what you're selling or listen to what you're saying. And I think most of us understand that at our core because say when we get a great customer service experience, when somebody provides unexpected value to us, we go back and we try to recreate that experience over and over again. So when you go to the Costco liquor store and the guy who's stocking shelves gives you a 10 minute lesson on red wines from Napa Valley 
and you really appreciated that experience because they provided you value, you go back and you try to get that again. That's why we go to the same gas stations over, the same hardware store, and that's why we maybe pick WestJet over Air Canada. So when my son was four months old, we had to take him on a, to a wedding in Jamaica, and we were absolutely terrified. He was colicky, it wasn't great. We're new parents, we we're absolutely terrified that we had to go on this trip. And we were flying WestJet there and Air Canada back. We showed up to the airport and we told the first WestJet employee that we saw, this is our first trip, we're so nervous, what do we do? And they were excellent. They grabbed their tickets, we didn't even have to get in line, they grabbed their tickets for us, they checked their baggage, they gave us a little first flight sticker and they even gave us an upgrade, so we got to fly the WestJet Plus. It was the most amazing experience. And with that little bit of time and with that little bit of value did, and that upgrade, the time and money that it took them, what that did is it gained a larger proportion of my total lifetime wallet spent when I'm traveling. Because I'm going to, and the Air Canada flight on the way back, let's just say it was a little lackluster. So, I'm going to try to recreate that experience over and over again. What you have to remember is that when it comes to building the relationships on, small, on social media, that it's very incremental though. So if you're expecting a return on investment, and this is a common I, comment I get often, if you're expecting a return on investment in two days, or two weeks, or two months, or even two years, then this probably isn't the thing for you. You have to remember that this is creating relationship at scale and it can be difficult at times. So some of you might say, look Cody, I get it. I get what you're saying, I understand that, but my client base simply isn't on social media. They're too old and they're too crusty. Well, I'm a beef cattle vet. My clientele doesn't get older or crustier, okay? And they're on social media. I'm not saying they're all on social media, on every single platform, but they're there and they're getting there and it's an exponential rate. There's, I'm always surprised. I have clients who are nearly 80 years old who are following my every move on Twitter. They're getting there and it's just increasing and increasing and increasing. So I was discussing some of these concepts with a marketing team for a large pharmaceutical company. And they told me that they had done a survey and that their clientele that the survey said their clientele simply wasn't on social media. And that made me really happy. Num or for a few different reasons. So number one, the data. So when did that survey happen? And remember, the customers of a large pharmaceutical company are you guys. And I know a lot of you are using social media at least to some extent. So number one, the data. So who did that survey? Was it a traditional media company that maybe thought they couldn't serve social, uh, a social marketing strategy as well as they could with print or copy? So maybe they manipulated that data a little bit to suit their best interests. Because you can make data say whatever you wanna say. Just like Blockbuster made the data say in 2005, when they were sitting down with Netflix and were going to purchase Netflix. But their data said, and they were gonna purchase Netflix for $50 million. Their data said that people actually enjoy the experience of going down to the big box stores, looking at the backs of DVDs, and they also enjoyed the serendipity of maybe coming across a neighbor and be able to have a conversation with them. But Blockbuster was wrong because do you know the experience that I like and the experience you guys probably enjoy is laying on my couch, eating a bag of chips and pressing one button and watching a movie. The data was wrong and they lost. We all know what happened with Blockbuster and Netflix is now worth $28 billion. It would have been a pretty good sell for them. So they made the data say what they wanted to say. The other thing that made this really hap made me really happy that the people, that the, the marketers said that their clientele wasn't on social media is because they dodged a bullet. Because the last place that you ever wanna be is last to the table when it comes to advertising and being on a platform. And there's lots of reasons for this. I talked about the, no the world is noisy. It is hard to get 
attention if you're the last to the table. If you're first to a platform and you let people come to you and you're learning how to use it properly and you're creating great context, it's so much easier to create a following and get very good engagement. And when it comes to paid advertising, frankly, it's just cheaper because when it comes to social media paid advertising, you're paying for clicks, you're, you're bidding for keywords and for key demographics. So if you're first there, you're going to be able to, to bid that for very cheap. How many of you have heard of the term Facebook dark posts in terms of social media advertising? I don't even have one. Okay, the marketer, I was starting to panic. He's gonna tell ABVMA they need to talk to me and not Kelly anymore. Okay, good. Okay, so what a Facebook dark post is a Facebook advertisement, but it doesn't show up on your fan page or your clinic's practice page. So what you can do is you can tailor that content specifically for a demographic, for somebody you're targeting. And the important part about a Facebook dark post is that you can target people with scalpel precision. So I'll share an example and don't judge me for this, okay? So there's a large farm that I would like to do work with. And I know the owner's name, I know the owner's son's name, and I know the manager's name. So about 15 seconds of a Google search and a Facebook search, I got what their birthday was, what their home, where they went to high school, and some of their likes and interests. And with that little bit of information, I could create content and send it strictly into their own Facebook feed for no money, no money at all, only if they clicked it. But I'm not putting in, and I don't wanna make the ABVMA mad, I'm not putting in things that say, book an appointment now. I'm not doing that. I'm creating and tailoring content for them. I'm providing them value. And what value did I put in there? I didn't know, and I should have been smart enough to figure this out, but I couldn't figure out what type of content I should have put in there for a large, large farm manager. So I asked one of my feedlot managers. I sat him down and I said, if you saw a paid advertisement in your Facebook feed from me, what type of content would you engage with? And it was simple. Something to do that would save money. So, for example, I created one that was the cost of improper implanting. I made a nice article, I put it on our website, and I sent that content into their Facebook feed because that's what they're gonna engage with. They're not gonna engage on these straight sales pitches, these right hooks over and over again. If you're in a boxing match and you do straight right hooks over and over again, you're gonna miss every single time. I'm providing value to them and I'm tailoring that content specifically for who they are. <coughs> and by providing that value, Maybe one day they're going to email me about a question they had in an article. Or maybe they're going to phone me. Or maybe just in the back of their mind I'm going to be there and they know that my practice has provided some sort of value towards them. And that's what social media marketing is all about. So I did some looking around at some of the other practices within our association and what their digital marketing strategies look like, the ones that were actually there. So, for example, the ones that had Twitter for the sake of having Twitter, this is what I saw. I saw over 90% of their tweets as links out. They were using Twitter not as a conversation, not as a cocktail party to create relationships and to create context. They're using it as a distribution service for some of their other social media platforms. So, for example, if a post from Facebook that you linked with Twitter said the world's cutest kitten, and maybe your clinic really did have the world's cutest kitten, and you put that on your Facebook page and you link that to your Twitter, what I'm going to see as a consumer of Twitter is world's cutest kitten, dot, 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 FB, it's a link out. When I'm consuming that content, I hate having to link out. Because when I'm on Twitter, I wanna stay on Twitter. If I wanted to go on Facebook, I would go on Facebook. I don't know if that makes sense, but it also takes more time. If I wanna link out, I have to wait for my browser to reload so I can interact with that, and maybe I'm not signed into the Facebook, 
So I can't leave a comment and I definitely can't interact or engage with that piece of content. That's what I'm talking about. They're not respecting the context. So if they did do a tweet and they took that picture and they put it natively into my Twitter feed as a picture, as a Twitter picture, and they provided a little bit of content as to what the text would be, world's cutest kitten, I'm going to interact with that. They're going to make it easy for me. I'm not going to retweet a Facebook link, but I'm going to retweet the picture that I get to actually see of the world's cutest kitten. The same is true for Instagram. I see a few practices out there using Instagram right now, which is great if you're just respecting the platform natively, but they're linking it to their Twitter feed and the same thing happens. I have to click that, click that Instagram link, wait for it to load, and then it's difficult for me to interact and share on the platform that I actually want to use. And what this means is if, is another example is if you look back at the, at the early mass media. So when television became more mainstream than radio, what advertisers did is they tried to recreate that ad experience that they were all comfortable with. So in radio, it was live reads of products or services, and it was also jingles, because that's the context of that platform that people were consuming. A jingle was music, and you're going to radio to listen to music, so it made sense. It fit in there. But when you tried to do that for television, which is a completely different platform, it didn't work. They didn't know what to do. So they had to step back and look at what television actually was. And it was a story. It was a visual story with rich characters and storyline. It was a completely different platform than radio was. So dawn the age of Mr. Clean and the Keebler Elves, these rich characters that people, if they were going to be interrupted by advertisers, then at least the content should fit the, the actual platform that we were talking about. But guess what? Marketers ruined it. How many times in the last, say, five years, have any one of you said, I can't stand watching television, but outside of live events and sports, I can't stand watching television anymore because there's just too many commercials? Hands up, anyone? Yeah, that's why we all watch Netflix now, or streaming, or TiVo, we use our PBRs, things like that, because marketers ruin television for us. Okay, Kelly, marketers ruin everything. <laughs> you guys are gonna understand this. So think about email. So in 1997, I don't know if some of the younger ones remember 1997 email. I, I had a Hotmail account. In 1997, when you guys got an email, you couldn't wait to open your email. You couldn't wait to read every single word, whether it was uh, for $100,000 from the Prince of Nigeria, or if it was from your mom or dad, you couldn't wait to read that. And how do you like email now? You don't, because marketers ruined email for you. That's why I have 2,300 unread messages in my Gmail and I, that replicates over into my Hotmail, and into my work email, because marketers ruin that for me. You guys remember Groupon or Living Social? And you couldn't wait until you got, for, until you got a, a, an offer for $50 worth of sushi for 20 bucks? You just love Groupon. But what happened? Marketers ruined that too for you. Get this, Facebook ads alone have permanently rewired our brains. The original Facebook ads the, on the right side, they rewired our brains. We do not see the right side of the computer screen anymore because of those advertisements. That's why Facebook had to take it out of the right side and put it actually in the feed that we're consuming because we just we couldn't physically even look at those advertisements anymore. Marketers ruin everything. So what you have to do as a marketer, to be successful is you have to look around and look at how people are consuming their media. And their attention's here, and it's on their tablet, and it's on Netflix. That's where the attention is, so that's where you need to go in order to be able to even start to tell your story. 
What the big companies, the best companies understand, so what the Pepsis and the GEs of the world have been able to do, that have made them successful in 1977 and 1997 and 2007, that will make them successful again in 2017 is one thing. They've done one thing over and over again. They have the one play that they're great at and they do it over and over again. And what that is, that one thing that they understand is they market in the year that they actually live in. So if it's 2014, you market like it's the year 2014. So that's why I'm here talking about social media. So when attention was on email, then do email. And when attention was on Google, then do Google AdWords. And when attention is on Twitter, then do the Twittering. And don't feel bad if you, don't, if you didn't get it. Billions of dollars are spent by big brands every year on TV and outdoor media, print, radio. You guys driven outside at all in the last year? People aren't looking at outdoor media. Their attention, their focus isn't going there. You're lucky if they're even looking at the road. Their attention's on their phone. Market in the year you actually live. And when you start to do this, and you start to see how people are, are interacting with that world, and then you try to get your story into that world, you'll start to see it a little different. So I wasn't told in May of 2013 that the social platform Vine was going to be something big. My summer student came to me. She told me about Vine. I looked it up on the App Store. It was number one. That means there's millions of people downloading it. It was new, but it was popular. I didn't guess that this was gonna be something big. So I got on there, I saw that eyeballs and ears were going here, and I learned how to use it, and the, the rewards have really paid off. So Vine, in, or Vine specifically, I'm one of the only veterinarians to use Vine. This is a six second looping video. So it's pretty, it's hard to comprehend if you can tell a story in six seconds, but you can. The reason you can is because people's attention span is ever decreasing. We can't sit and read books anymore. We're narrowed down to six seconds. That's all you can ask people to, to have, 140 characters. You can't send somebody an email. I noticed that in my emails recently that I'm lucky to write an email that's over 140 characters long. It's brief, it's short, because people's attention spans just aren't there. So by me going onto Vine, I was marketing in a space where the eyeballs and ears were actually going. So I guess that's kind of my thesis, and it goes definitely goes a little deep. So I'm going to back up a little bit and talk maybe a little bit about what social media is and then share a little bit about how I actually storytell, the, the purpose of my talk. But I wanted to ask if anyone had any questions about what I talked about first. Cody, with all this information that's coming out, you, you say it's every 48 hours we're getting you know, a couple of thousand years worth of data. Yeah. It just boggles my mind. Where's that all going and what are we doing with it? It just seems to me like we're producing information for information's sake. It's, it is noise. Everybody is becoming a media company. Whatever interests you, whatever your passion is, you're trying to get that information out there. That's why we see so many blogs and blogs. People want to take that and run with it. They want to be, they want to be happy. They want to do something in a field that they derive great enjoyment out of. And the best way to do that is to become a media company for that. And that's where it's all going. So even though you think, I can't fathom where all this information is going. It's still being consumed if it's in the if it's good quality content and it's in the right context. But it's short, for sure. Anybody else? Okay. We will talk. Oh, it's 
an easy way to communicate? I don't know a ton, but social media is communication. Play time for big kids and grown ups. You can talk by Skype or internet or Facebook, Twitter. People show what they like and about trips and stuff like that. If they have a pet, you can see their pet. It doesn't cost any money. Adults usually post pictures and stuff. You could talk about things on there that you want to talk about and see what other people are doing. Be social without being social. That's kind of the way now for people to know what's going on. They can just go on Facebook or go on Twitter and say, blah, 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 blah. Facebook? No. It's kind of a website where people go and chat with their friends. Teenagers, I think email's too slow for them. At that point of your life, you have the most friends and you know the most people and you just want to get it out to the world. When I get older, I want to be friends with everyone on Facebook. I want to be friends with everyone. So that video is a little tongue in cheek and kind of pokes fun at social media. To be social without being social, I get it. But how I describe social media to people is it's basically the web 2.0. It's the evolution of the internet and it is a social place. It's a place of connection. It's how we consume the internet and we like to chime in and we like to have our two cents about everything. But if you look at the actual word media, what media does for us in a general sense is it provides three things to us. It provides us with entertainment, it provides us with education, and it also provides us with communication of thoughts or ideas. That's what media is. And social media is just doing that on the internet stage. So for me, Twitter feed. So we all know about Dr. Pohl. He's this Nat Geo Wild veterinarian. He has his own show. Uh, the small animal people always get in up, up in arms because he's doing spays without uh, wearing gloves or masks or anything like that. But on Twitter, it's a source of entertainment. We get to follow his story and it's exciting. Education and news. So a thing that I would consume would be the AVMA Twitter feed. Um, sorry, the AVMA Journal Twitter feed. So this is where I'm learning about new articles that are coming out, the most latest and recent research. I'm consuming news that way. I rarely consume news in a traditional media uh, platform anymore. I'm consuming the news that I want to consume, and that's it. And communication of thoughts or ideas. So communication, that one's a pretty important one to me. One, in, and we'll keep with the Twitter theme, one would be Farmers of Canada. So the Farmers of Canada Twitter account is basically a curated account where one farmer or person in agriculture takes a hold of that and they talk about their story. So it, the account itself has many followers and it's so easy to get interaction and engagement. So you just talk about your day, you show pictures of your farm, you answer questions about your production setting. It's an unbelievable place for that communication. So I don't wanna just stand up here and also sound like some evil veterinary marketer. So there is some other things where I derive value out of the internet 2.0. Advertising, number one, is definitely there. But number two could be advocacy. So advocacy for me is advocacy of the agricultural industry where I provide transparency and I consume transparency and openness of agriculture. Where we use information about agriculture to combat misinformation that's out there. It's one of the only tools we have to combat this misinformation and we need to be there advocating for that. Number three, social media provides excellent customer service for me. So it's such an efficient means for me to provide client education, allows for great interaction of clients and owners and managers. And each 
individual person prefers to communicate in a different way. So I communicate with various people on so many different platforms because that's what they're most comfortable with, whether it's text, whether it's them looking at their phone, recording their face and sending me a message. There's just so many different ways to make my clientele feel comfortable to communicate with me that way. And it really is more efficient. I get so much more response back if I send somebody a Twitter message as opposed to an email. I think a few of you can appreciate that. If you Twitter message me, you'll probably get a response. If you email me, it's not gonna happen. Number four, student awareness. So this one's pretty near and dear to my heart. So at our practice, we have about five months worth of students coming through from the University of Calgary. The student awareness is big. So by people, while they're going to school through their academic careers, when they're following my account, we create this relationship in this context. And that's gonna pay off in the future because I'm gonna have so much more relationship with these people. I'm gonna have more interns, I'm gonna have more externs, I'm going to have more resumes coming off over my desk when I'm looking to fill some sort of uh, job. I'm, and these people are there. The new graduates, if that's something that you guys are interested in, the new graduates are all on this platform. Our own education, and this is something that has really taken me aback. So there was some Cowie types in my class for sure, but I wouldn't say there was a lot of cow vet types. So it was hard to create relationships and conversation based on that. If we just, all I wanted to do was talk about cows, cows, and more cows. And that was, that's hard. We have that in our practice, but it's hard to kind of, that's only three other people that I get to talk to on a daily basis. But there's this huge community of cow vets out there in the world, whether it be in Australia, in the UK, Ireland, Quebec, across Saskatchewan, Alberta, that I get to talk to these cow vets every single day, ask them questions, present cases to them. And we have these conversations in an open environment where producers can chime in, farmers can chime in, academics can chime in on our conversations about case management and mass, say it's mastitis control or controlling liver abscesses or general conversations about BRD. This own education, I've learned so much about cattle medicine just from being on these platforms and seeing the pers different perspectives that other people had. And then community. So I think some of you can appreciate that at times our job can be a little lonely. So for a large animal veterinarian, I'm often in my truck for long stretches at a time. I could not see somebody for 12 hours because all I'm doing is stopping and hacking deads. Or if you're a small animal practitioner, maybe you're doing nothing but vaccine appointments all day long. And you're interacting with your clientele, but maybe you're not connecting with other people in your profession. And that's one of the things that this can do. Now I want to tell you guys a little story, and it's called Vote for Vidim. And it really hits home the sense of community that can happen on using the web 2.0, using social media. So what Vote for Vidim is a story of a Ukrainian veterinarian named Vidim Pradko. He's 30 years old, he has one child, and he lives close to the Poland border in the Ukraine. He works as a veterinarian and feeding manager of a large dairy in, for that country, a few hundred cows. And he also acts as a veterinarian to the locals. So the local villagers, he takes care of their pigs and their cows and their horses. So who Vidim is, is he also liked to tell his story on the web. He told his story primarily through YouTube in early 2013, he started shooting videos to teach local veterinarians, producers, both in the Ukraine and Russia, things that he's learned as a veterinarian. And he was very astute. He really, really tried, and he tries so hard to learn how we do things in Western medicine. He's very astute and very keen. He wants to share that knowledge. And for him, he shares that knowledge through video. And I really related and connected with that because I like to do that as well. I like to 
tell a story using video. I feel like it's very effective and I can do it well. So one day, and this was actually in February of 2014, this year, our paths crossed. I ended up watching one of his videos and I commented, the video was in completely in Ukrainian. I couldn't understand a single word, but I knew he was telling a great story. I know great content when I see it. So I commented, I wish that I could, I could understand what you were saying. And he recognized my icon because he'd been watching some of my videos. And he translated that in Google Translate. He read what I read, or read what I wrote, and he wrote back, and we started this relationship. We started talking through the YouTube comment section, and that got a little messy. So we moved over to Google Plus and we started talking on Google Chat. And then we friended each other on Facebook and we started chatting there. And every single one of our conversations was through Google Translate. And we have we have hours and hours of conversation. He wanted to know how I practice, how I deal with certain issues, what the Western medicine approach is to various diseases. We talked about shooting video. I wanted to know what type of programs he used, what type of camera he used, how he does his setup. We created this great relationship. So in August of this year, BCF Technology, so this is the ultrasound company that makes EasyScan, they announced their third annual video competition. And the grand prize was an EasyScan 3. So I contacted Vadim and I said, this is a video competition. Anyone can apply. I'll help you do it. Let's create a video and we'll submit it and we'll see where it goes. So he agreed to it, we collaborated, we came up with this video, and we entered it into the competition. We made it into the finals. I'm gonna play this video for you guys right now. That's his vet office, just so you guys know.
That was video from their ice bucket challenge at the end there. <laughs> so they even got on board to support ALS. So that was the video that we submitted. We found out from BCF a few weeks later that we made it to the finals. We were in the top six. So voting had started and we needed to garner as many votes as possible. So I did what I do best. I launched a massive social media campaign. I was tweeting about it, Instagramming about it, sending out vines and snaps and Facebook dark posts and Twitter advertisements. I even took advantage of that of the poor traditional media and did interviews for newspapers. So the local Airdrie Echo interviewed me and uh, the Alberta Farm Express and I got all the support. And what really hit home was the sense of community, the sense of community for the agriculture industry that's on the internet, that's on social media. We had support from everywhere we could think. I was getting phone calls from uh, cow bosses on Hutterite colonies that had been following on Twitter. They'd been watching this and they said, if we don't win, we're gonna, we're gonna band together and we're gonna buy him an ultrasound if we have to. I got so many of these phone calls, people wanting to support. Other people got behind it. We sent out email to every university. You guys might've got someone in your, some of the emails in your inboxes. Pharmaceuticals, academia, we took advantage of every relationship that we had created, every relationship that I had created and provided those people I've provided value to over the last two years. I, I did my right hook, I did my sales pitch, and what I needed was a single vote from them. So we found out three days before the competition ended that we were in second place. BCF spilled the beans. I think they kind of had a, a bias towards us. We had touched us. So they let us know we were behind and we redoubled our efforts and we tried everything we possibly could try. I Facebook, I individually Facebook each person that I knew one at a time, please go to this website and vote for Vidim. Every single person on my Instagram, almost 900 followers, one at a time. My, I was sitting beside my phone at night, tweeting out and Instagramming. It was, it was rough. So last week, we heard that we won. They tallied the votes and Vidim won the ultrasound. And we won by 316 votes. It was a small, small margin, but we did it. So I got to talk to Vidim for the first time. He was standing in his bathroom at midnight in the Ukraine in his tiny little apartment. And he sh squared himself away so he didn't have to, or he wasn't gonna wake up his wife or baby. And we were trying to get a video chat going, but he didn't have a camera or a phone with a forward facing camera. And he was trying to use the rear camera and the bathroom mirror and it just wasn't working, but we had a conversation and I recorded it. And I told him once and he didn't understand because he doesn't speak English, but I told him again and he, he knew just enough to understand. And he said, BCF ultrasound competition, we won. And I said, yes, we won. And he was so happy. So I'll share with you his response. So in true Vidim style, he made a video, his thank you speech. Hello, how are you? I am fine. As a result of the contest, and I don't sleep, I wait. Oh my, I wait. Oh no, I cannot believe we won! It is incredible, man! What wrong with you? You are not happy? I must go for sleep. Thank you.
dear friends, I am totally uh, full of pleasure and want to thank all of you for your support and your votes. You are also our victory is all thanks to you. Cody, you are a real hero of social networks. It is great and titanic work to organize our participation in this contest and to unite thousands of people for voting. We also are very grateful to the team we will be with and that rockies. Stay with us. We love you and we are going to join you making our creative video clips. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and forgive, forgive our bad, horrible English language. We, we must learn the English language. And, and we do, and we do. We have a teacher, Anatoly, we have a teacher, and I uh, learn English language. Goodbye, goodbye. Thank you, thank you, friends. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing Anatoly crying still makes me a little misty. <laughs> so that was the story of Vadim. So the ultrasound is en route to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan right now. That's where Vadim's dad is actually visiting. And he's going to take it back to the Ukraine actually tomorrow. So we can't wait for him to get it, and it's going to be a pretty special thing. So uh, I guess as much as I stand up here and talk about inter internet marketing, uh, there's still a lot of really good things that can come out of, of being a part of social media and being part of that community. So I think we have about 19 minutes left. So I'm just going to show some of you, some of you newbies, a little bit about what I do. And all I'm going to do is it's very simple. I'm just going to scroll through each one of my platforms, and I'm just going to show you how I tell my story and what the context looks like and what the, some important key features are for each one of the platforms. So this is the Vet Agri Health Facebook page. So Facebook is really all about storytelling. Because if you think about what we go on Facebook for as a consumer uh, of that piece of media, we go on there to catch up. We go on there to see how people are doing, to look at photos. It's all about being social. So when you're putting a business or a brand up there, you need to remember that it needs to fit that platform. You have to have good copy, it needs to look neat. Photographs that are very striking have a lot better engagement. Videos actually right now are engaging very well on Facebook. And it can be something as simple as patient of the day, this dog came into practice. A small, small video will go a long way. So here's some recent content. So we wrote an art, my tech actually wrote an article on two stage weaning, provided a link to our website. Another article on the importance of feed testing that people can interact with. The chronicles of me and my summer student, Gen Z, a short video of us out at a donkey farm interacting with 30 miniature donkeys. It's people just wanting to see what we're up to and what we're doing. I, don't, I was going to show you guys a Facebook dark post and how easy it is to do that, but I think we'll skip through that. So any questions on Facebook? How many hours a day do you spend on social media? On social media? It depends on the day. If I have a full day, I'm not there. The only thing that I make sure that I'm doing is actually responding to people. That is the, the key. So yeah, there's times where I wake up in the middle of the night and I'll check it, 
I'm not trying to create content doing that, but I'm trying to at least reply to that. Because if you just ignore people, all the hard work, you go away. Some days I do zero, some days I'll do a few hours. What I've, I guess what I've done is I've done it to incorporate, I've incorporated it into my day. So if I'm waiting uh, for a feedlot to haul a postmortem, to haul a dead for me to do a postmortem on, I'll send out a tweet. Or if I am making a video and I see some interesting pathology, I'll show you some of that later. Sure, I'll take a few seconds and I'll record that video. But I'm really, really, I really, really focus on micro content and doing things that you can just incorporate into the spare seconds that you have. And yes, it might add up to half an hour in a day, an hour in a day, but I'm trying to fit it into gaps that you already have. And that's an important thing for me. All right, my Twitter feed. So like I said before, Twitter is a 140 character cocktail party. It's all about talking and relationship. So when you start off on Twitter, they have this rule of thirds. So you do a third uh, content creation. So you're actually creating tweets. You do a third that are retweets. So you're actually providing uh, copying and pasting into your own Twitter feed, basically, uh, information that somebody else has. So that's also known as curating. And the other third is responses and replies and interacting with people. I would argue, though, that once you're doing it successfully and that people want to talk to you and engage with you, it's more like 99% replying because you're just having that conversation with people. And the, the 1% is creating a little bit of content and also throwing out some retweets and curating that because it takes one second and you're basically creating just a little bit of content. So this is my Twitter feed and things that I'm doing. So I'm providing right now to my followers that my talk is live. I'm asking people to say hi if it's working great for you. Conference room for review. So this is different. So this is actually a picture that I did for Instagram, but I repurposed that content for Twitter. Instead of linking my Instagram to my Twitter and all you seeing is a, and all you see is a link, you actually get to see that content and people are going to interact with it more. So for example, I have seven favorites on that and I posted it just before the talk started. A retweet of uh, VMD technology. So I just did a I just did an app uh, review. I did a little blog on uh, the Novartis' Scour Boss app that they have out now, and it was posted yesterday. So they had tweeted, VMD had tweeted out about it. Uh, so I was providing a retweet there. It's, but what I am hiding here is actually my tweets and replies. So the replies are the important thing. This is the conversation, and you can see there's lots of conversation going on here, talking back and forth about people and what they do, any questions they have. You have to remember that Twitter needs to be to the point, that you can provide hashtags, and that helps people search out your content, and you have to provide things that they want to engage with. And right now for me, if I tweet out just text, I'll get 10% engagement. That means 10% of the people who see that tweet are going to interact with that. If I add a picture into the mix, that's 20% engagement. And if I add, add a video, like a six second vine, I have 30 to 40% engagement. So I'm tailoring that content to try to get maximal engagement because that's what people are wanting to consume. Instagram. Instagram is a visual centric media platform. It's basically like a magazine without the editorials. It's visually stunning. And the people that I interact the most on here are with students, techs, and farmers' daughters. So I'll show you a few pictures here. So severe mycoplasma pneumonia in a feedlot. The steer was uh, 37 days on feed. 
and the rest is just providing hashtags to make that searchable. I'm making sure that this, this content is visually stunning. There's my little baby playing with my summer student in the postmortem pit. If you spend Sunday saying, if you spend Saturday playing peekaboo in the postmortem pit with a vet student and a sheet of momentum, you might be a cow vet's kid. The point isn't the picture. The point is that the picture fits into that context, that it's visually stunning, that it grabs people's interest. This one did very well. So it's the day after preg checking, and I just provided a filter and I cropped it well, and people wanted to engage with that, and I'm telling my story through pictures. That's what Instagram is. It needs to be artsy. Getting short on time. Okay, Vine, so I talked about Vine, so I'll show you a little bit of that. So this is the six second comedy. This is what I'm getting a lot of attention Somebody about right call. now. And that's all it is. Some that's of you might think that's Now we're defending with the weather. So I do this recurring schnauzer weather report. It's stupid, it's silly but people engage with it, they interact. They're, they're getting something out of that. It's how I'm being a media company. Um, can I get a cup of meat for my miniature schnauzer? <laughs> I know, it's silly, but it is what it is. This is, people are spending ungodly amounts of time on Vine. So just push the cows up when I get there. Water, check. Ball cord, check. Energy, check. Schnauzer, check. Pillow, check. Road trip, water, check. Get in the truck, Finn. Get in the truck, Finn. Hey, get on the feed box. <laughs> Cow whisperer. Hey, get on the feed box. Cow whisper. I wonder if cows can report the weather. Now over to the cow with the weather. Nope. I wonder if... Now over to Phineas with the weather. Uh, all right. <coughs> no. Now over to Phineas with the weather. Man, I got that was a blooper now reel. Phineas with the weather. He doesn't always cooperate. <laughs> Now we're to Phineas with the weather. Kind of chilly, don't forget you too, Katie. Now we're to Phineas. <laughs> I just like that one. There's a chronic bloat, little pre wean calf, and he's in the hypermotile phase of rumen contractions. You can see the rumen sliding under. It's not really buying appropriate, but it is what it is. I'll get you guys a few more here quick. Now over to Phineas with the weather. I hate the rain. <laughs> Go pick up a check from Dave on the combine, they said. Come on, Dave, where you at, bud? Go pick up a check. So I'm just telling my story, and it's easy to do. I'm able to tell it in six seconds. Albert Phineas with the weather. <laughs> Albert Phineas with the weather. Now over to Phineas with the weather. <laughs> now over to That's Vine, is all it is. The reason that I'm on there is people's attention are going there. The eyeballs and ears are going there. I'm not saying my 80-year-old feedlot client is on Vine, but maybe their son or their grandson is. And that's why I go there, because it's easier to get attention and it's an effective way that I can tell my story. 
So I guess enough about me. There's other veterinarians doing a great job out there. I just wanted to, this, I feel like this is just such a, a good case study that veterinarians could do anywhere. So this guy's name is James Askew. He's an exotics veterinarian. And all he does is he does cases that he sees in his exotics clinic. He records them, he makes two to three minute videos and they're amazing. They're so simple, but they're to the point and they tell a story and they really show off his personality as well. There we go. Get it before it's Um, absolutely. So I'll, I'll let this play, then I'll answer that. Good morning. Um, I have been uh, brought two turkeys. We had some phone conversations about the, what these guys could be suffering from over the phone last week. Um, we give them some ideas. Um, anyway, I'll put back and walk into a room and see a turkey just sitting up on the camera. If he poops, they're going to run in the sink. Girls will love that. Anyway, I've already made a mess in the room. There's like Feathers and stuff everywhere. Mom, I was doing. She give permission, really. But anyway, um, uh, these guys are brought in for for lesions in their nose and sinuses. You can see the swelling right there. Um, also, the, uh, the blackhead thieves going on. And I am not seeing any class on them whatsoever. But anyway, we're going to talk to mom first, and I'll come back and do some more. So this runs about three minutes, but this is just an example. He gives you the signalment, he gives you the case history, some of his diagnostics and treatment options. He tells his story. And for him, he tells that in a digital way. This is a way that he's comfortable and he gets a lot of engagement, a lot of comments. So I've noticed a lot of time with his stuff, he does ask, like he always asks for permission if he's going to record an animal the clients are actually in the room with him on the majority of his videos. So they're recording, he's talking about that case, the clients appreciate that, they feel like they're part of the practice, they're part of the story, and that they're, whatever issues going on with their animal, maybe they're going to help somebody down the road. So I feel people have been really receptive. In my own practice, if it's a new client, that I've never had the conversation about social media, I mean, taking pictures or videos, I always ask, some practices actually have a, a paper confidentiality form. They get you to, and the veterinarian will get them to sign that, that can we distribute a photo of your animal on our clinic's Facebook page. I do have permission for everything that I do when I'm on the road telling my story. The only time that I wouldn't would be if I was, if say I did a post-mortem and I had a small part or piece, say I had a, a urolith that I wanted to take a picture of. I wouldn't necessarily go to go to the owner to ask a question about that. And cow vet medicine is a little more lax from that. To help me tell my story. And they just find it exciting because they enjoy when they get to watch me do my thing at other farms as well. So I have everything out on the table with them. Everything is open 100%. Well, I'm, I have two minutes left. That's basically all I wanted to talk about. I was gonna show you guys my YouTube video, or my YouTube channel, I'm not going to. I was gonna show you Vidim's YouTube channel, I'm not going to. I was gonna talk about Snapchat, but we can leave that for another day. So I'll leave the last minute for any other questions. Tough crowd. That just means I did a really good job, right, guys? Okay, well, it's 3 o'clock. Time for Kelly to come up, and we'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you all. Please, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You've given us lots, lots to think about, mainly evaluating our storytelling skills, I think. 
So it's time for a break uh, till 3.30 and then Kelly Cromwell will be coming up. So thanks again. Defense marketers. <laughs> <laughs> they ruin everything.